All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, you're talking to Jeff Stead in our office in Cambridge, which is uh, pleasantly pleasantly sunny today. It's been horribly wet and miserable the last the last few days. Um, I'm hiding out in one of our meeting rooms together with Joe Colley, who I'll embarrass by putting on camera over here. Hi. Hello. Joe and I have been working together in mobile learning for a good ten years or so, um, and she's going to just help me uh, respond to questions and come that come up in the list and, and join in the presentation. So our mission today is to look at some of the theories that underpin mobile learning and try and interpret the gap between the, the pedagogical theories and what actually seems to happen in practice or what people are doing in practice. Um, thank you very much for filling out the survey. Most of you would have seen uh, a live summary as, it, um, as, you, as you hit the end of the questions, but the people who got there at the beginning wouldn't have had much to have a look at. The people at the end would have got a bit more. I'm looking at the final set here, which I, I don't have a simple way of showing you, but it's showing us that most people are considering themselves in the middle of experience, uh, drifting about 40% of you are considering yourselves dabblers, and about the same 40% consider yourself professionals, and then about uh, 20, 20 beginners. A um, large number of people joining us are from Europe. Thank you very much. Great to have you there. Um, I'm running, we're running this session twice, so we're hoping to catch some of the different time zones in the morning. Um, a fairly even spread between the different areas that, that pe um, people have, have, have work in. Um, about 45% corporate learning, training, 60% uh, learning technologies. Bear in mind, you can choose several. So in, in this particular one, the percents don't mean, don't mean quite as much. Um, but a, a third of you research academia, 40% uh, in mobile development, 40% universities. So quite a quite a nice uh, range. So thank you for joining us, and I'll do my best to try and lead you lead you through the session. So we talk about mobile learning. We came up with this sort of concept of mind the gap, just as a bit of play on words, and really to try and explore the area in between. Very briefly. Um, we're based in Tribal, uh, we're from Tribal, we're based in Cambridge. Um, we're huge enthusiasts for how technology can improve learning. That's probably our, our, our strap line, if anything. I have a small team here. We're, we're a mixture of a research lab, and we build content, and we build technologies. Um, most of the groups we work with aren't in schools, or if they are in schools, it's schools where the education is failing and, and the technology is trying to compensate. Um, uh, you, you may know some of, some of us. There's a list of names at the bottom there. Not all, not all that public, um, but a mixture of technologists, educators, writers, media people, um, a couple of different links of, of, of websites we keep up to date or blogs that we write. Um, so very enthusiastic about how in practice to make things work. And we build stuff. We build content. We build apps. We build, um, so the challenge today is to talk about mobile learning theory. And uh, in one of the Moby MOOCs on um, last week, John Traxler summed it up very, very nicely. He basically said, there is no way to summarize everything that's going on in, a, in any kind of simple way. And if you want one theory that explains it or explains what you should be doing, there isn't one. So a bit of a, a, bit of a, a challenging start. But I, in fact, I agree very strongly with John. So what, I'm, what I think, what I'm proposing we do is we look through some of the sort of four or five sort of pedagogical theories or, 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 or theories that try and map and explain mobile learning explicitly, very, very briefly, just jump through them. Um, uh, Nick, you're asking whether I'll send out the PowerPoint. Very happy to. I'll put it up, I'll put it up on the SlideShare up afterwards. In fact, I think I'll put it up the SlideShare tomorrow after I've done the second session, just so that I can make some amendments and refine it a little bit. But then I'll, I will certainly do that. Um, and if you watch my Twitter feed, you'll get the, you get the details. So I'd like to step through some of the theories that are most often referenced in mobile learning, trying to be as broad as possible. Uh, quite a few of you responded to the question put out on the, um, on the forum yesterday, looking at different examples of mobile learning. And it was a, I was very really reassured. It was a broad spread of, of activity. And in almost all cases, it was, it was intertwining itself quite nicely with practice. Um, so, so, which I guess is, is some of the dilemma here, is that there's so many different ways that you can interpret mobile learning. So let's go through. I'll talk about some of the theory, then I'll talk about our perspective on it, and then we'll try and work together to create some lessons out of it. 
So this is our mission. This is our shared mission. It's one I'd like your help with too. I'd like by the end of the week to put together a set of five, eight, ten top pieces of advice from us, from this group, ways to help educators who practically trying to work with mobile learning to take advantage of the good bits of the theory but not be swamped by all the things they, they, they should or shouldn't do. So I'm hoping that the questions that we post on the forum for the rest of the week and some of the questions that, that come out here, actually you, you, can help, you can help put this together. This will be a, a tangible outcome at the end of the week that we can share. So let's start with the theory. So um, Diane and Lauren are Gets a lot of gets a lot of dialogue in some of the earlier stages about this conversational framework, which predates mobile learning, but it's about how learning intersects with technology. Um, there are some later examples of it or iterations of it, which which present mobile specifically and try and try and add a slightly more complex piece to it. But really, it's trying to make the point that there is no the learning doesn't just channel through the device. It's a series of actions and interactions that are a bit to do with the technology and a bit to do with the learner and a bit to do with the problem they're trying to solve, which I certainly agree with, although, although to me this doesn't actually help, this particular theory doesn't help me understand what I should practically do, but it's, a, it's quite a useful starting point. Um, if you do have questions about any of these, please shout out. I'm not expecting to go too deeply into, in, into any of them. So the second one, I guess, Builds on on some of the ideas again, not not linked into mobile, sort of Vygotsky and Engstrom about activity theory and about the interaction of of task and tools and the subject matter and how those interact with each other, um, and a, a team of team of people in Nottingham or Birmingham and then Nottingham spent a couple of years, um, to Sharples, Taylor, Vulik, working working through this and trying to understand how that would apply to mobile. Um, they were very, very big on, on the learner themselves being mobile, the importance of mobility in it, and the importance, once again, of doing stuff, doing concrete stuff. It's not the, the mobile device isn't a, a pipe to send you content. It's a tool that you're using as part of some, some other broader activity. And you, you can see, if you follow their writing, you can see the same model with various words swapped out for different contexts. So if they're working in a museum or they're working in a, a medical training situation, they've They've, they've transposed some of the different words. So this is another one of the theories. It's quite, in fact, Sharples is quite often quoted in mobile learning. He's one of the one of the earlier researchers trying to understand the domain and, and express it in a, in a sort of academic way. All right. So this is a more recent one, number three. Um, Park. What I what I like about this is he tries to take on board the fact the fact that it can be distance learning. So until this point in time, a lot of the the academic research was more around ex existing cohorts of students in a classroom type context. And, and so he's not trying to describe what's going on. He's just trying to give a sort of framework that you, that you can map different types of mobile learning on. And so in, in, his, in his framework, the high transactional distance, the idea is it's, it's kind of like distance learning in e-learning. You're a long way away from the actual process. The low transactional distance, you're sitting in a classroom. Individualized, as you can imagine, distance learner sitting in an outpost in Australia, working remotely with with, uh, with remote class classmates, socialized. You're a group of people going into a museum and taking photographs of things. Um, so, so he just came up with a, a framework to try and describe the different types of mobile learning and package them in different places, so that when you were looking at um, at, at projects or activity or trying to learn lessons. That you that you are grouping things in similar in similar places. Um, so this one is less of an academic theory, and it's more uh, it's, it, it it comes more out of the performance support domain. So um, you come across this in work based in workplace training in corporate training, trying to help trying to help people figure out where um, some performance support, how to improve your performance. And, and there's a fairly well-established idea of five moments of need. Um, so the, the first moments are the first time you learn the information, um, at, the, at the point that you're hungry to learn a bit more. And, and those are sort of often the traditional training type of, type of information, knowledge delivery piece. And then there's the application of the knowledge, which is more, more typically uh, described as performance support. 
And so this is when you're trying to remember it. Uh, when, when things go wrong and you think, oh, I'm going to go back and figure out how to do it. Or when, when, when the situations change and you have to relearn it. And um, in mobile works quite well in the, in the performance support arena because it's really about quick access to relevant pieces of information while you're working, while you're doing something else, while you're, while you're engaged in tasks. Um, and so this, this model seems to work, describe quite, or it's a place that mobile fits quite nicely in the performance support arena. It's also useful in the training and the learning, but in, in the corporate area we found that particularly useful, it's a really comfortable fit. So I thought that was a useful uh, a theory to, to offer here. And, and finally, this is another one, a bit like, a bit like the park one, where it's a, it's a way of trying to capture some of the different aspects. Um, and I, I guess this is the one that, for me, actually is the most useful, and I, I find the most useful, and I, it, it connects the closest with my, with my, my thinking about mobile learning and what, what we do with it. And really, it makes the case that there's a real interdependence. Mobile learning isn't one thing. It dep it's different depending on the context, depending on the type of device, depending on the the uh, subject matter that you're trying to learn, depending on the group of people you're working with. And, and so all these different, um, the, the technology, all these different pieces in, interlock into each other. There's not really one, um, one answer. There, there is a com there's a combination of, of, of pieces that you put together when you look at your particular scenario. Um, <laughs> the learning collage, thanks, Joe. <laughs> um, and this, I think, represents this, possibly the slightly chaotic nature of mobile learning, but also why it can be very, very personalized. It, 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 it's a combination of things unique to your particular situation, context, device. It also makes it very, very, very difficult to get too smart about academic theories about mobile learning, because it can be so different in these different situations. Um, so I, I, I like, I like cool, um, cool in this particular situation, mostly because it helps you understand that there's a whole lot of different dimensions. It's not one concrete thing. I'm going to pause for a moment in case there's uh, any, any, any questions. I'm going to look at Jo, because I can see she's frantically writing things in the, uh, in, in the chat. Jo, are there any things that I particularly should be responding to? Um, about the similarities between mobile learning and mobile learning. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So that was a um, that was a uh, 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 Joe. Joe, uh, not sure if you could hear that, but Joe was commenting on a on a comment from E.T. Russell about the school of the air and how how distance learning has been a it's, it's hardly something new. Um, one of the things I I most like about mobile learning is actually it's a combination of, of a whole lot of things, many of which aren't particularly new, but it's just forcing us to shake up our thinking a little bit and weave things together nicely. So yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Great, great example. All right, so so those are the, those are the things that are fit in the more academic theory end of the spectrum. But I've got a couple of more ideas that often often get get brought up in mobile learning and are maybe maybe sometimes used to describe some of the different types of mobile learning. So the, the one is the one. This is this is fairly fairly dated. It's the the idea of, of uh, the, the forgetting curve, or the, um, how how you forget what you're told, and how it's ongoing iterations that help you remember what you're told. And this 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 curve is used in in quite a lot of different arguments, and some of the arguments are about having small reminders that remind you to do things again, uh, sort of micro repetitions, and, and mobile does that very well. It's also um, it's also used to say that you actually should be doing things with the knowledge you learn. You shouldn't just learn it in abstract. You should be learning it as part of a context of doing thing. And it's the repeat, repeated doing that helps you helps you um, hang on to that information. So I'm not I'm not particularly making a a, a judgment here either way. I'm just saying these, these these are the theories that quite often surface in the discussion about mobile learning, and I think are relevant. Um, so we, we do use this idea in some of our some 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 of our mobile learning. I guess particularly where there's a maybe a vocabulary you need to learn or a fixed set of facts that it's a sort of drill and practice you need to get. Um, 
and and using this repet repetition idea, space repetition can be um, can be quite helpful. I've heard it called space learning as well, but I think actually that's something slightly different. All right, Clark Quinn is a um, uh, an author and mobile learning enthusiast from from the states, and he he repeatedly has a mantra about the four C's of mobile learning. Um, really, this is just a reminder that that. It's, it's not a pipe to consume information. It's a tool to do different things with. And so he's, he's sort of reminding you that it, it can be useful for accessing content. Um, it's also useful for actually being used as a tool and doing stuff. It's useful for capturing evidence of things that you're doing. It's useful as a, as a social, social tool. So these are, I mean, when you look at it from, from within mobile learning, these are blatantly obvious. Although, although very often when I start conversations, people not familiar with it, they're assuming that we're sitting very much in the top left corner, that you're sitting in the um, content the content area. Okay, but here's here's the here's the problem, here's the, the challenge for us, I guess. And this is how you make use of this information. Alright? So there's a collection of different theories, some which could guide practice, some which are about explaining things, some which are about comparing different types of projects. But if actually you're a teacher trying to use mobile learning, or you're a, um, an, an IT person worrying about supporting people bringing their own devices, or in our case, if you're building apps and content and, and tools, you know, how do these theories help us? What, what, what can we do with them? So um, here's my, 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 my take on it. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a landlocked surfer. I grew up in um, I grew up in South Africa. I spent a lot of time in the waves. Uh, don't get to do nearly enough of it anymore. Um, so, so my take is that actually you can't control what's going on. There is a there's this massive swell of mobile web, mobile smartphones, internet wherever you go. Um, no, <laughs> sorry, that's not me on that wave. I think I'd, I'd probably die if I wasn't such a big one. I'd be up for trying it, but I'm not fit enough. Um, there's this huge rush of, of things happening right now to our learners, to our students, whether they're kids at school, whether they're students at university, whether it's adults at work. And it's there anyway. Mobile's there anyway. It, it, it's spreading rapidly. Um, so the best we can do is try and figure out how to harness it for good, how to make sure that we, we try and make use of it in our, in our teaching, in our delivery of content, in a way that's, that's helping and not hindering. I think we can't control everything, we can't theorize everything, we can't wait till we've got the perfect model, because by the time we come up with the perfect model, the waves rush past and we're stuck in the, we're stuck in the, in the whitewash. So, so I, I'm quite nervous about trying to rationalize everything. What I'd rather try and do is to try and perfect some of the skills you need to be able to ride this wave but really, it's a wave, and we're not going to stop it. We can't hardly hold it back. So the best we can do is just ride with it and try and make the most of it. Um, yeah, Larry, like you say, tons of devices, different operating systems, thousands of apps. So, so we just finished a big, a big project with the U.S. government. And they were really keen on, on very precise facts. You know, test 30 different types of phones with our apps. Test how they are. Test how well they're used. The problem is as soon as you finish the test, there's another 20 that are useful. So if, 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 you, if you get too precise, you immediately date your, your thinking. So, so let's try and take, take the, the right theory into, um, <laughs> into practice. Uh, Nilgun, I'm sorry, there isn't a there isn't an article on this. Um, this, this is you have to you have to uh, come and have a conversation with us. It's an evol it's an evolving theory. It's ha it's how we guide what we make and do. But um, it was only a week ago that that I actually gave it a name. So I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm yeah it's in progress. Um, so the one the one the one approach is about iteration. Don't try and understand everything from the start. Don't try and get it all right from the start. Rather, start in small steps and iterate and keep improving. So if you've got funding for a two-year project, don't buy everything at the beginning of the two years and define exactly what you're going to do. Spend a third of your money in the first year 
and, and buy some things and try it out and then and then you can buy newer devices later and try different tools so in, in all these pieces of advice that I'm, I'm trying to split it into into two chunk into two steps so I'm trying to see if this works um, the, the bit at the, the bit at the top is 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 what we're thinking uh, it, and then I've, th this is the bit that, that we probably use the most internally when we're building stuff. This is, our, this is the way we interpret start small practice, keep improving. But there's another, another, another way of interpreting the same advice if you're actually doing a, a, a live project or as opposed to building something. So I've tried to split these. So they don't all, always necessarily join together. There's two different, there's two different um, stories. So, so with the learning design, there's always a dilemma between the, the, the subject area, the technology, the, the, the learner in the context, and there isn't a single answer that deals with all of those perfectly. There's always, it's a bit of a compromise and a dialogue. And the way we work that through is by iterating. We, we do start with, we might do user, user des designs on paper or on screen and put them in front of users. We, we, then, we, then we start building mock-ups and prototypes and get feedback. So this, this iterative idea um, really, really helps us. It, it, it makes the things we build much more likely to be useful and, and to be appropriate. And on the implementation side, um, I, I guess it's to bear in mind that in any new technology, this is independent of just education, when, when you introduce a new technology to an existing set of tasks, whether it's a sort of production line or whatever, there's a very typical transition. At the beginning, you translate what you did before, but you've got these new tools, and you try and do the same thing with the new tools. And then after a while, you figure out you can do some new things with those new tools, and you slowly migrate across to a sort of tr more transformative phase where you're evolving some new methods that you can use building those tools. And mobile learning is certainly about that. And so this, this um, if, if you try and lock in what you're going to do right at the beginning, you'll be stuck in that translate phase, where in actual fact, the real learning, both for the learners and for the practitioners, is, is, is when you get to the more transformative stage. So you need to try and plan that in. That was my, that's our first point about, about the sort of constant iteration. Um, so the next, the next point is about making sure that you are prepared to flex, that you're building in the ability for things to be used in ways you didn't, you didn't think. So in the, in the surfing metaphor, I guess it's about a couple of different boards and different wetsuits to combine to cope for the most <laughs> widest range of waves. But in the, um, in the context of the mobile learning, so in the learning design, our approach is to try and make lots of small, discrete nuggets of content or, 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 or learning, to try and really separate out the, the information that you've got in your in your in your course to, or the information you need to deliver and and the method you've got to for, for learners to make use of it to try and really separate those so that it allows the content to be reused in lots of different ways so we try and break down content to small discrete nuggets we we try and plan for multiple different ways that you might access the same content um, we, we we don't focus just on content we also try and think of tools and we also try and think of collaboration scenarios and mix those together which allows much wider range of use. So example of that in the content might be making sure that although you, you, you're building an app, you're also building an ebook that can be downloaded to an ebook reader and you have audio files that can be in your app but they can also be out of, out of their app. Um, Larry's asked a question about, um, yeah, so we, we're huge fans of HTML5 um, and in fact if you're interested in that I can, I can give you quite a lot of information on some project work we're doing at the moment exactly on HTML5. But I would go even further than that. I would, I would say that sometimes within the HTML5, you, individual media types, video, audio, might be useful independent of that. If you just upload them straight to, to YouTube or you have to upload them separately. We, we've had quite a lot of success with just straight eBooks as a reference guide. So we, we lift bits of the eBook out into some HTML app type learning content, but in addition make the eBooks available to other devices. It just gives you a broader spread of devices. We're not trying to make the same experience on an ebook reader than we are on a smartphone, but we're trying to make some of some of the media available. And um, so on the on the implementation phase, I, I guess it's to try and adopt a wide range of different learning modes and don't try and focus too much on the device. Now this I was very I was very pleased to look at the examples that you were posting in, in the um, forum. Thank you for that. Where 
in fact, very few people were too locked in on one device or on one set of activities. But, but the examples you were showing were very much, were very much in this, this kind of uh, range, not making the device everything, thinking about the activities, thinking about the learning, thinking about the bigger, um, the bigger mission. Um, Joe, should I pause? Is, is there a question from Nick? Uh, I think we did check that we can talk about um, the technology and activity. I don't think we have any internet. So that content and technology that you can try the other. Nick, um, can, can, can you help me? Are you asking about um, the activities and learning transcending the technology? Is that, is that, is that what, what you're asking about? I, I, I'm only partially following the chat while I'm talking. Yeah. OK, so. so um, I'll give you an example of how not to do it, and then we can work backwards from that. So I think, I think a, a, a poor example, which, which you do find nonetheless, is where somebody tries to take a, a training course, a prescribed training course that happens, a face-to-face -face training course of some sort, and embed the entire thing into a mobile course. And technically, it's quite possible. You can do that. You go in, but, but, but then suddenly, the entire learning is happening just inside the device, and you're locked into that particular device and the particular technology that you've used to, to, to build that, what, what seems to be much richer would be an example where you're using your phone to rush around and take pictures and, and collect media as part of a project, or where the reference materials are on the phone, but the learning activity involves some physical looking at a piece of equipment, scanning it with your phone, finding finding information about what's on what's on the equipment. So, so things where, where the learning the learning or the learning problem that's being solved can't be solved just by somebody in front of their front of their mobile device. Rather, the device is a is a tool. It's part of a broader piece. Um, does that does that answer the question? Does it does that help? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I think we picked that up. So, and the third the third dimension of of, of my my surfing metaphor here is about resilience. So. Um, I'll start. I'll actually start with with the implementation. I'll start with the implementation piece. If you're starting a project, uh, a program, a, a sort of class mobile activity, you can be guaranteed that by the time it's finished, there's some new devices that have come out, or that things change, um, that the way you want to use them might change. So, it, anything you can do that stops locking yourself into one device or one system or one software solution, even the ones that we make is a good idea. I'd, I'd strongly encourage people to try and s separate, <laughs> separate out things a bit. So, so um, yeah, try and th think about the whole bring your own device idea. Even if you're not doing it right now, even if you're using a specific uh, device, so you've, you've chosen iPod Touches and you, you use it, even if you're doing that, try and think of activities that would work without the iPod Touch. So think of activities that, that extend beyond the specific device. Um, a, lot, a lot of classroom-based mobile learning initiatives struggle in the beginning where the teacher thinks that they need to understand everything and help everything and solve everybody's problems and then and then have a rejuvenation when they figure out that actually the, the learners can help can, can help one another and can solve some of the problems themselves so sort of crowdsourcing support from the learners um, is it, really good so 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 I guess the whole idea is don't try and control all the details of what's going on but ra rather just help people understand how to use these tools so, so on, on the learning design, uh, it's a slightly more technical thing, we're quite obsessed about using standards and existing technical frame, frameworks and separating out technical layers of things we build. So if you swap one bit out, another bit is still useful. Um, so I mentioned the, the content earlier. So, so we're, again, we're quite obsessed with HTML, HTML5, EPUB, MP3, MP4. We combine them into apps and, 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 and content packs and tools. But but you can also disaggregate them and reuse them in other devices. Um, I, I'm very happy to go into more detail about this uh, for people who ask later. It's, a, it's an area we've done a, a quite a lot of work and quite a lot of research, so, so I'm happy to share that. So, so I'll just jump it back. So I guess that's the end of my, my, uh, my surfing, surfing met metaphor. I'll just jump back to the beginning again. So it's the idea of starting small, practicing, iterating, um, the idea of trying to build in flexibility into what, however you're doing things, and resilience. Okay, uh, what's the question? Ah, good question, Sergio. Um, 
So I had a slide on that, but I'm pretty sure I dropped it out because I was worried it was too it was too technical. So I, I, I apologise. Um, there aren't a set of standards which are perfectly suited to mobile learning. But what there are is there's a range of, it, it depends on how techy you get, right? There's a range of technical frameworks which are very portable, like jQuery mobile and, and, and to, frameworks that you do stuff. And there's standards for various bits of the, of the feeding chain. So it depends a little bit what you do. What, what we have is we have a, we deploy an app in the App Store and we send content to the app. And the content is packaged in HTML5. Uh, with the in zipped in a zip file with some XML data describing what to do. I guess a little bit like SCORM if you're familiar with the e-learning area. Um, so so you can un anybody can unpack it and understand what's inside, and anybody else can create their own content and feed it into our ecosystem. And that's worked really well for us. Um, uh, the the U.S. government's taken it on board slightly enthusiastically and are deploying it at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm again I'm happy to share more wide information at the end um, if, if, if you've got more questions at the end. So, so that, that's our take. But I can, I can show you a more detailed breakdown of how, how we've packaged up different pieces of the content and, and shared it. All right, so we were talking about content. I'd like to come back to this. So, so again, um, another one of my, um, I guess, I guess uh, things that I struggle with when I look at the theory and I try and think how difficult it is to really apply the theory in practice is that you can have an, uh, some, con some mobile content, a mobile app, which, com which abides by all sorts of fantastical theory, but is rubbish. Uh, it's no, the usability is no good. Learners don't know what they're supposed to do. It doesn't look nearly as rich and engaging as, as, as other apps they install on their phone, and particularly in the, in, the work, in the older learner scenario where it's their own phone. You're using their phone in their own time. You're trying to encourage them to, to learn on it. I would argue that it's really, really critical that the pedagogy is good, the usability is good, the content's engaging, it downloads fast, so it's a real mix of, of tech and usability and pedagogy, and that's what makes compelling M learning sort of an M learning media. Um, and it's not easy. Too much, too many of the theories focus just on the pedagogy of, of, of how it's used. And actually, if you want to find out uh, information about kind of Usability or, or, or some of the other some of the other dimensions. You don't look in learning theory whatsoever. You go to people who in, who are interested in mobile web and mobile web design. You go to people who are interested in in app usability. But but actually, the real answer, if you really want guidelines and how to get it right, is to is to mix those together. Okay, so these are. These are um, my thoughts on what we can extract out of the theory. And I guess they're possibly my starting points for, the, um, for that, that mind the gap list. But I'd, I'd quite appreciate your, your, your support and help in this. So the first one is, is the, the activity area, that really it, it's a good idea if you can use people's mobile smartphones to do stuff, to do activity. So the second one is about, this is more for a teacher or a tutor, is letting the learners take part in the process. Don't try and do the process and expect them to do as they're told. Let them help define the process and define how they use this. And the third is how critical it is, how, how important the context is. So this could be focusing what you're creating, focusing it around the learner's real moment of need. It could be about thinking where they are and what they're, need, and what they're doing at the point that they're interacting with it. There's a lot of different ways of interpreting context, almost all of which are valuable when you're thinking about mobile learning. And the fourth one goes back to the surfing metaphor and just allowing the space to iterate, to plan for some agile evolution of, of, of what you're trying to do, whether it's building your, your app or whether it's rolling out a program with a group of learners. And the final one is that there isn't one size that fits all. This is going back to Cool's um, uh, Venn diagram at the beginning. There isn't one way that defines all mobile learning or only one solution to it. It, it, it does evolve. It does. It, it is different in different scenarios. So these were these were my um, these, these were my takeaways. But I'd, I'd quite appreciate um, if, if anybody can can respond some some other other thoughts or takeaways or tips in the, um, in, in the chat, that would be, uh, be really helpful because we'd like to try and 
pull something together um, for the end. All right, so these are just a couple of different examples of, of types of projects. Most of them are ones that we've been involved in. The little kid on the left is my younger son. He's just moved up to secondary school. And their secondary school has just announced that they're encouraging kids to bring in smartphones. Um, uh, using, the, using smartphones in school, they're encouraging to use them. It's not, not compulsory, but they're going to be allowed to use them in the lessons. They're busy figuring out exactly what that means, what the protocols are. Um, they're offering families some free uh, firewall type, uh, um, sort of, uh, what's the word, not firewall, sort of blocking um, spam or, or block, blocking software if, 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 if they want them on, on the kids' devices. Um, so they're, they're actively trying to figure out how to make it work. They're, 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 these are, these, they're not the first school. There's other, other great, great schools that have really led the way. The Wolverhampton are famous for being one of the very early adopters in this area, and they've got some fantastic lessons. But it's just one of the examples. So it's weaving it into existing provision. No, oh, chat's going too fast. I can't keep up. <laughs> Joe, is there anything I need to respond to on that? Okay, um, so I guess I guess so. There was a question about about how to how to weave agile into mobile learning. So it, it depends a little bit on the context. So in this particular context here, with my son at school, they're doing that all the time. They're testing out how to fit the, integrate them into different lessons, and so they'll probably try them in music and decide actually that didn't work very well, and they'll use them in history and find it's fantastic as a reference tool. So they they are busy actively going through those iterations with the students to try and learn together with them. Um, but it does depend a little bit on what, on what you're trying to do. I guess the, my, my, my main warning would be if you've got a budget and a contained amount of time that you're trying to achieve something in a two-year window, a one-year window, don't try and define everything absolutely right at the start of the window. Allow, allow yourself space to, to, to move during the, um, during the project. All right, let's jump to another one. Um, so this is, oh, I think I've lost one of the pictures. Maybe it'll come along. All right, so this is a project uh, I, I'm a huge enthusiast for and have spoken about quite a few times. Uh, I was invited to do a, a TED talk um, focusing a lot, on, a lot on this project. It's called Emma Ubuntu. It's in, South, it's in a couple of schools in South Africa run by a small charity currently in, uh, currently in Italy. Um, and they had the idea that, that you, could take, you could raise money for a, an M Learning kit, which was a, a box with, with 20 phones, a wireless router, a webcam, a laptop, and there were phones without SIM cards in, so they, they, were, they were often sponsored or donated, but we're using them in place of small computers as research tools, as a variety of different tools. And, and it, it, their aim wasn't to, just to improve the education for the learners. Their aim was to improve the dialogue between teachers talking about the process of education. Quite conservative, um, a lot of South African schools are quite conservative and resistant to change, and they were really struggling to improve the quality of the teaching. The more senior teachers, the more junior teachers who had the energy were, were terrified into submission by the more senior teachers, and the more senior teachers were nervous to change. And the introduction of these technologies and, and connecting young teachers in schools up with other, other young teachers had a real transformative effect in, in just, just having creative angles on the lesson. So the lesson on the top is that biology students um, looking at their textbooks, but actually they're building apps, they, they're creating media to build quiz apps to give to other students in the, in the class to test them on the biology. So they're, they're kind of working, they're busy creating a, a, a game as, as part of the activity in the class. What, what's the question? Uh, yes, I do. Um, so, I mean, I, I would be hugely in favor of SMS. It's tricky to do too much with it. So, so we've built various SMS apps in the past where we're, we've got a server that collects the, the, the questions. We had a variety of different ways of doing things with it. And it's quite tricky to do something deeply meaningful. We, in fact, we've stopped using SMS at all. We, we've focused very much on the smarter end, smarter phone end of the spectrum at the moment of the last couple of years. But, but like, like the comment at the beginning about um, using, using, radio, using radio to push out to push out sort of distance learning message, I think any communication can be used powerfully. Um, the, there's another great example from, from South Africa um, called Mixit. Um, oops, I just lost. 
Am, am I still on? Am I still on? I've just lost. Uh, thing. Oh, there we go. There's another great example from South Africa called Mixit, which is a, a messaging. Um, it, it's like SMS, but it's it's instant messaging, so it's over data. Um, it's been around for quite a long time. It was a cheap app that you or a free app that you can install to any quite low tech phone, and it's now and and for free messaging. And there's some great examples of educational activities there where the cost of sending the message is significantly lower. Um, SMSing is a strange thing because the costs are very different in different countries. Some countries it's very, very cheap. Other countries it's actually quite expensive. Some you pay to receive. Some you only pay to send. And so models don't always work equally in different places. Um, it's a fantastic open source system. Yeah, Ken Banks, thank you. Thank you, Nelly. You've just mentioned that. <laughs> uh, Frontier SMS, but there's, and, and there's a few. If you, if you look at Frontier SMS, there's a couple of different projects that they're working on, which, which are great. You need to invest then in setting up a server to run things, um, which is, in fact, what we were doing before as well. You have to set up a server to run things. So they, 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 there's some great examples of, of reach, and it's awesome for reach. But it's quite difficult to have meaningful, meaningful dialogues. So where teachers have tried to use them inside a class to collect feedback, it doesn't seem to work very well. People have tried, uh, BBC and others have tried to use it as a sort of testing you know, uh, sending out tests and answers, and they were they were <laughs> they were um, they, they, those were abysmal failure. So 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 these examples have been used quite well, and something used quite poorly. Um, <laughs> thanks, Billy. Yep, definitely tele telepathy. It's the way to go. Um, all right. So then we also do we also do a lot of work with people at work. All right, and and this is people who who they've got a date, they've got a job. And the they've got the personal phone, and you you helping them with some additional reference information. And here, even more strongly, it has to integrate with what they're doing. It has to integrate with their life. It has to integrate with their needs at that moment. Um, it's installing on their own phone, so you can't force them to go through a cumbersome interface. They just won't use it. So so you you really need to have a very very tight user experience in, in you, how you build the content, how you access the content, how you find what you need to know. Making it relevant to them with, with a minimum of impact, um, and, and because it is their own device that you're asking them to put it onto, you you can't treat it in the way some some sort of institutionally deployed devices are, where there's all sorts of rules and instructions. Um, so uh, I have some examples. In fact, here's one here's one example of this. So this is a program we're doing in, with McDonald's in the UK. They're offering free training to all McDonald's employees. Outside their mainstream uh, corporate responsibilities around improving customer service, English skills, math skills, um, the the app is in the process of being launched. It's actually in the App Store at the moment, but it's it's being a bit it's being a bit hidden for various reasons about McDonald's PR. Um, but this is a, a quick movie that I'll show you, which is a PR movie for the McDonald's employees. But it just gives you a little bit of a, an idea. So this is small chunks of learning content. Targeting quite specific areas of need. Um, if I can figure out how to how to play them, I'll I'll launch one. Here we go. Can you see it, Joe? Can you see that? Yeah. All right. So uh, so so our idea there was they're already. Um, can, sorry, can you hear me? Am I back on? Yeah. Um, our idea there was these small chunks of learning content that are optional. They pull them down only if they want them. And McDonald's is offering their employees the chance to take sort of UK-wide qualifications in English and maths. Um, which for a lot of the a lot of the youngsters who come from other countries or, or people who've dropped out before the end of school, it's actually quite a, a, a attractive proposition. But so they know the levels that they're working at. They know they're aiming for level one or level two, um, and they just want to get there as quickly as possible. So the, these we run a big online e-learning system for them doing this, and we knew of the thousands of people that go through exactly the area that most people had the most problems. And so these 20 or so modules that we've made were targeted precisely on the areas that we know adult learners are, having, are finding difficult to get their heads around. Um, the video piece was a huge success for us. We didn't quite expect those where we recorded ex explanations. We, didn't, we really didn't expect them to be nearly as popular as they were. Um, but they've been a runaway success. People watch them again and again and again. Um, so it, we slightly reshaped our thinking a bit. So we're now quite, quite keen on, on, on video. And there were some tech questions earlier. These are all built in HTML5. Everything you see here is HTML5. We package it as an app, uh, but the app itself is just a shell. So when you go and download things, it's all in HTML5, JavaScript, all of those kinds of kinds of details. But I'll stop. 
Um, yeah, so, so it, yes, it is, it's McDonald's, it, the reason I'm having, uh, yes, yes, we built it, this is all, this is what we do, we build this kind of stuff. So the reason I'm hesitating is that McDonald's didn't want to make it more widely available um, and released it, so you had to have a McDonald's employee number to be able to download the content. But right at the moment, we're having some interesting dialogue with, with um, Apple, who've changed their rules about the kind of apps you can put in the App Store, and they don't like that you put an app in the, app, in the public App Store that not everybody can access. So it's very like, well, one of the versions is already in there at the moment. We're in the process of re, re releasing it in, which allows anybody to download a couple of the pieces of content. Yes, Android, iPhone, um, Kindle, that's, that's a whole a whole driving force for these things is it must be cross-platform. The content you make has to live beyond the device that it's, that it's on. Um, so again, if you, uh, I, I, I normally talk a lot, my, my presentations are usually a lot more technical than, than this, this one has been, but I've, I've got a lot more information on that. Um, okay, so, so, and then there's one, I've got one more movie to show you. We sort of, we're, we've got another eight minutes or so to go. So this is a different project we're working on. Um, it's been quite an extended project. Two year, it's a two-year project, just about, just about finished. Looking at multinational, funded by the U.S. government, looking at medical workers, disaster relief workers who get rushed into a nation from um, to help after a disaster, and how bad they are at, at sharing information with one another. Um, and so, so, so we built a whole bunch of content, and this is where we've done a lot of the research on the different technology frameworks and how to make it. Um, sorry, Nelly's asked a question about who's we. Are you asking me, Nelly? Ah, um, I, I work. Uh, I work with Joe in an organisation called Tribal. Uh, we're we're mobile learning mobile learning people, mobile learning technology people in the UK. Um, you can. Uh, there'll be some links at the end that you can follow. In fact, any of these project sites link back to us on the slides. Uh, if you if you um, go to m learningorg that's us. I write a, a, a blog called Mob Learn. I write another one called Tribal Labs. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll stop now. <laughs> so there's another another movie I want to show you. Um, this this one is uh, uh, setting the scene for why our mobile learning app our mobile app was important in this in this project. It's not the app you see here isn't identical to the final one. This was a prototype that we made in the very early stage. We made this about a year ago, but we've now done the trial with uh, 600 different people, 20 different, 21 different nations, collected feedback from them using the app. So, so, so this is just setting setting this, a context for a work-based context for why why you might need um, uh, why you might need mobile learning. On the way to work. Oh, no, not that one. One second. The R uh, maths and English I'm sorry. Bring the learning experience. Let's try again. All the training, nothing can fully prepare you for responding to a disaster. Every scenario is different, and the call can come at any time. But wouldn't it be helpful if you could access the latest information and relevant references before you deployed? And wouldn't it be great if that access was at the tip of your fingers? When a society crumbles, when nothing works anymore, simply...
simply gathering information can be a challenge. But imagine having the ability to record critical information even when you weren't connected to a network so that information could be shared with your team the minute you were connected. Sometimes the problem lies with language and culture, and we can feel helpless trying to care for those in need. But we can overcome many of these barriers if we had a range of tools available. to help us communicate more clearly. With so many agencies involved, resources can be scarce in one corner and overflowing in another. I'll stop that for now. So we don't have a we don't have a, um, a, a lot a lot of time left. Um, so so I, I was going to mention another project we're working on, which is very much focused on these reusable HTML5 ways of describing courses and share them backwards and forwards. Um, we also have a, a, a whole lot of open source tools that we're sh hoping to release in the next couple of months to try and make this easier, um, which I'm happy to answer questions on. Um, but really, I wanted to come back to to here. I guess it, I'd like your views on advice that we should be giving to educators. I'm also happy to field any other questions. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left. I've extended the session for another five, so we've got a few minutes more. Um, thank you, Clavier. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'll leave you with my my details at the end. If you want to get hold of me or ask questions about about anything. Um, but yeah, please. Um, should we? Uh, does anybody have suggestions of things they'd like to add here? Or yeah, very nice. Um, or any questions you'd like you'd like to ask me or Joe?